Uh, hello, everybody. Um, for those that are joining us today, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to meet you in an informal um, venue, which I think this lends itself very well to. My name is David Riley. I'm one of the physicians at Boston IVF. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. And Boston IVF, as I think many of you might know, is at the forefront of a science that allows families to thrive and to help parents have families to provide an environment where a child can be loved and therefore thrive. And it's wonderful to be part of this particular medical science and to meet the patients and the men and women that we assist. And tonight we have a very special guest and I am very humbled and honored to introduce her. Her name is Elizabeth Carr, and she has a lot to talk about that will give you some perspective of what infertility is, but just, if not more importantly, what it does. So I would like to introduce Elizabeth, who's going to give us the opportunity to tell us about her journey that brings us here tonight. Elizabeth. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all streaming in. Um, thanks for having me. I always love uh, chatting uh, on things like this. So I'm Elizabeth Carr, and I am the first IVF baby in the US. Uh, so 40 years ago, uh, wow. in 1981, which everybody knows my birthday, I can never hide. <laughs> Um, I was born uh, three days after Christmas as the first successful IVF birth in the United States. Elizabeth, that's amazing. And again, I'm humbled and honored to have you here. Um, if you wouldn't mind, can I ask you a question or two? Sure, please do. So as part of the unique journey that you're informing us about tonight, how were you told by your parents or your family, if that's the case, that you are an IVF baby. What did that mean to you? How old were you? And what, it mean, what does it mean to you now? Yeah, sure. So I think um, first I should give you some background on, um, I actually currently live in New Hampshire, uh, but I grew up in Massachusetts. So a uh, big Boston IVF uh, neighbor, essentially, uh, you know, um, and my parents were living in Massachusetts and had been married and had tried for a couple of years to have a child. And uh, after my mother's third eptopic pregnancy, which is basically a tubal pregnancy in which there's extreme internal bleeding, um, her OBGYN said to her, I don't think you'll be able to have children of your own. Um, and we're going to have to remove your fallopian tubes because there's so much scar tissue. Um, she had a botched, a botched appendix surgery, essentially when she was in her late teens. Um, and the scar tissue was really causing a problem. And so they removed her fallopian tubes. And then at a checkup, um, you know, after that surgery, her doctor sat her down and kind of threw a one page brochure across the table to her and said, I just came back from a conference where I learned about this thing called IVF and it's been done successfully in England. They had a baby in England right. and there's a couple working on getting a program up and running in Virginia. And the OBGYN said, I think you should apply to my mother. Um, and so she applied. So fast forward, that was their story. And um, they did not know that they were going to be the first couple in the US to be a success. And actually um, when they did the transfer of the embryo on my mother's birthday actually and came in with a cupcake. <laughs> was that, they, did they do that on purpose? Did they time it purposely? I, I'm not sure it was on purpose, but it, my mother said it was very lovely. It was a very wow. nice birthday present. That's cool. That's <laughs> um, cool. they, they were singing her happy birthday. And then when they found out that she was indeed pregnant, um, Dr. Howard and Georgiana Jones sat down and said, well, now you can keep your story private and we can keep your name out of the press or you can continue and, and go public so that people know that this is an option. 
So my parents made the choice then to know this is important. People need to know about this as an option. We're going to stay in the public eye, even if we have a lack of privacy. And um, with that came the filming of a Nova documentary. So this is the long-winded way of answering your question of how I was told. So you are much more interesting than anything I could possibly <laughs> say. So feel free. So um, they filmed my birth. The Nova crew filmed my birth, and uh, it aired. And when I was very little, I asked my parents the normal, "Where do babies come from?" And my parents just always said, "We couldn't have you without the help of some very special doctors." Um, but when I was about seven, I actually had Dr. Howard Jones on one side and Dr. Georgiana Jones on the other, the pioneers in the field, uh, screening the Nova documentary of my birth with me and explaining in detail how I got here. So <laughs> that's my real answer of how I figured out how, how I was born. Um, I always knew that it was, you know, the first and it was you know, this historical thing, but actually watching the Nova documentary kind of, you know, made it really sink in. <laughs> that, I can't stop smiling. <laughs> I, I love that story. So you saw how you were conceived on a Nova, doc, Nova documentary. Do you know, mm -hmm. as I listen to this, I look back at my professional career. I don't want to make this about me, I promise. But when I was in residency in the 80s, IVF was this uh, very um, abstract concept. It was abstract and success rates, as you probably know, because you're right. incredibly well educated in this, were low. I mean, they were low. And what I would love the folks here that are joining us tonight to know is that tubal factor infertility, which is what your mom suffered from, 25% of my patients that's why they see me. So yeah. for those who are here today, if you've had any primary care physician, particularly an OBGYN, has told you that you have had issues with your fallopian tubes, IVF number one is the only way you're going to conceive successfully, but it is successful. You are looking at that success. <laughs> and back when, and what I'm trying to say is back when I was a resident, we we just didn't have, number one, I can't even imagine the cost. Yes. And number two, we didn't have the technology to even do it the way we do today. So I can only imagine what your mother went through. I can only imagine how they had to lower her and I assume your father's, I'm not sure, expectations. And that has led to where we are today that has become, I would consider and the latter half of the 20th century, IVF is one of the medical success stories. Right. It's up Absolutely. there with contraception. It's up there with um, antibiotics. It's, it's amazing. And to think when I was in training, what we thought about it to where we are today is amazing. And you're living proof of it. And again, to reiterate, I'm humbled and honored. To see yeah, and I mean, if you, if you think about it, um, you know, to your point, um, the technology, back then was so rudimentary that even the ultrasound um, to see if I was healthy, um, I was only five pounds, 12 ounces when I came out. And so actually Dr. Howard Jones had written a statement and kept it in his pocket um, in case I didn't come out okay, because they really couldn't tell via the ultrasound if I was gonna be okay. Um, and the other thing to think about is now with, you know, Dr. Georgiana really of the team was the brains who really said, I think we can use hormones to stimulate, um, to retrieve eggs. And so my mother was really one of the first people who went on the, you know, the modern hormone protocol that we have now, essentially, however, they would have called it they, Perganol, which we don't they even did. call it. She was on Perganol. Perganol. She, she was yeah. one of the first people in the world to go on yeah. Perganol. Um, yeah. But, you know, now you can stimulate and get, you know, six, seven, 10, 12, 14 eggs. They got two <laughs> from my mother. And you're looking at one of them. <laughs> that, because and they only can transfer one back. And it was, only, it was a day three transfer, right? Yes, exactly. And there was no ultrasound guidance. There was nothing. It was 
Um, actually, my mother tells a very slightly embarrassing but very funny story <laughs> that um, in order to do the transfer, uh, Dr. Howard actually had to blow into the end of a pipette to get the egg uh, into <laughs> where it needed to go. <laughs> I can't even talk. When I think of what we do now, it's funny because again, here I am looking at, you know, this path that we've all taken from then to now. When I was in fellowship, we didn't do ultrasound guided transfers because we didn't have ultrasounds that could do it. Right. And once we had ultrasound guided transfers, which there's no way they had back in 1981, success rates went crazy. Right. Good. So you truly are a success story. So your mom went, underwent just one cycle. That's it. That's amazing. That's and, and, and at the time, um, so my parents were one of about 10 couples actually um, selected via this, you know, application process to undergo this experimental, they called it back then, program. Yep. And within the cohort of couples, actually, every single couple had a different protocol because they were still very much trying to figure out what would work. And so my mother always says that it was really difficult because they kind of kept everybody separated so they couldn't compare notes. So on the one hand, they were all rooting for each other because they wanted the people going through this at the same time as them to, to actually end up with a child. And on the other hand, they were thinking, oh man, but I really hope my protocol is the one that works. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, it was a very, it was very much the wild, wild west, for sure. It, it absolutely was. And I thought it was that way when I was in, like I said, when I was in residency, <laughs> but for all those folks who need to utilize what we call, as Elizabeth knows, ART, which is artificial reproductive technologies, this is the proof of its success. And again, I am overwhelmed by it. I love it. And congratulations. I, I, I mean, I Thank think it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. an, it's a fascinating journey you've had. And it's wonderful to see you healthy, happy, and with a family and life of your own. So that's great. That's awesome. I, 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 like I said, I love coming and chatting. And especially when I get to talk to people like you, because, you know, I'm very aware of how important the work is that you're doing, as well as all the patients that are on, on with us now, you know, that are really going through this journey um, maybe they've been successful. Maybe they're in the thick of it right now and don't right. know. Um, you know, my parents really had no idea if this was going to work, and it just was a, a giant leap of faith and trust in their physicians and their care. You know, team essentially, um, who all, by the way, are still very dear, close <laughs> friends of mine. So, you know, the embryologist in my world when I was especially little she was not called the embryologist. Uh, she was always just Cinda, my egg lady, who actually, if you know anything about the field, she's like the foremost um, embryologist in the field and basically wrote the textbook on embryology. But to me, she was just my egg lady. Right, right. <laughs> so. you're, you're living proof of why we do this. And congratulations to your parents. And thank you for sharing the story and the journey. I, 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 I'm going to stop. I won't be able to stop smiling the rest of the night, but um, <laughs> um, congratulations. It's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. it's great, great, to ha great to be here and thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Have a good one. Okay, folks, I think we see questions coming in. Um, I just wanted to set this up to make everybody understand how I'd like to use this venue tonight as a relaxing way to talk to a reproductive endocrinologist, not one who might be rushed in the office, not a patient who might feel pressured by the nature of the visits. And let's talk about all the things we do, all the questions you might have from infertility treatment to fertility preservation. And one of the best parts of doing this job is recognizing, like I said at the beginning, is it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter who you love, it's the opportunity to help you either have a child, build a family, or preserve future fertility. So let's start addressing some of the questions. So first question I have here is, I am a 50 year old man, previously had two healthy children, but definitely worried about sperm quality. This is a great question. Is there a process to be able to retrieve healthy sperm at volume sufficient 
to have a successful pregnancy occur. So as men get older, particularly over the age of 45, there does appear to be decreases in the parameters that we look at when we look at sperm. We see a lower concentration. We see a lower volume to the ejaculate. We might see lower motility, but none of this appears to impact or address the fertility of that man. So there's no real way to change your semen parameters. There's no real way to make your sperm better for natural conception other than living a healthy lifestyle. Watch for weight. Men, just like women, but men who are overweight are gonna have more problems with their hormones and therefore more problems with what we call spermatogenesis. Smoking is brutal. Smoking cigarettes is so toxic to spermatogenesis and smoking too much pot. Um, THC, we don't know enough about, but live the lifestyle that your doctor has been telling you your whole life. At age 50, if you're going to conceive a pregnancy with someone or help a, an individual conceive, there are concerns as men get older, maybe the children born have higher rates of being, for instance, on the autism spectrum, but statistically these numbers are so low and so difficult to tease out, it's not a reason not to have a child. So the best thing you can do is stay healthy, but we cannot choose the best sperm. And we really don't see a huge impact on these parameters changes changing on, on your fertility. Uh, does Boston IVF do gentle IVF? And can you speak to exactly what it is in its success versus typical IVF? That's a really hard question to answer because none of the data on gentle IVF, which I think the patient is referencing, is where you take lower doses of the medication that stimulate the ovaries to assist in perhaps getting a lower number of embryos, but of higher quality. There is no study that says who is the right patient for gentle IVF, who is the wrong patient, and there's no study that gives me a control group to say who should have it. The data that is out there might suggest that patients of a more advanced reproductive age who might have what we call a borderline ovarian reserve might do better with gentle stimulation. But to say that it's better than routine IVF and to say you're the perfect patient is impossible to do because the data is poor. So oftentimes when you do IVF for the treatment of infertility, you learn more about the patient as you go along, as opposed to knowing what that patient might need at the very beginning. So if during the process that patient is found to have less of a robust response or doesn't respond well to higher medications, perhaps once you learn that, a more gentle stimulation would be appropriate. What is Boston IVF's success rate for patients with an extremely low AMH and a high FSH? Okay, so just so we're all on the same page and we know what we're talking about, FSH is the follicle stimulating hormone, the hormone that a woman produces each month or an individual produces each month that gets that individual to ovulate. And its measurement, particularly at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, predicts how that patient might respond to the medications, which are actually the FSH, to help produce lots of eggs. I have absolutely no data that can tease out what our success rate is for a patient with a high FSH at age 34. I don't have that data because there's not enough data to tease out. But when you talk about the ovarian reserve, you're talking about quality and quantity of eggs. And in particular, we're talking about how you're going to respond. And for women over the age of 38 or individuals over the age of 38 whose ovaries are going to be stimulated, a high FSH is going to result in very likely a poor response. Whereas someone who's younger, such as being referenced here, might do better. But I can't tease out the individual success rates. Um, AMH, a low AMH, AMH is a hormone. It's produced by all the growing follicles, meaning eggs. It's the most sensitive predictor of how a patient's going to respond. An AMH of 0.15 and an FSH of 22 is significant for being a diminished ovarian reserve and predicted to have a low response to the treatment. At age 34, 
it might be worth a cycle, but the success rate is lower than what you would normally expect. I just can't tell you what that success rate would be. And certainly if that patient was not responding to multiple treatments, you'd want to think of an alternate approach. Why choose a three-day transfer versus a five-day transfer? This is a great question. So again, so we're all on the same page. For patients who need IVF for assisted reproductive technology to get pregnant, <clears throat> what's going to happen, eggs are going to be retrieved, and they're going to be fertilized. And one of the dilemmas is that there's a rate of attrition that occurs in the process. A certain number of eggs is going to give you a certain number of embryos. And then a certain number of those embryos are going to be watched in the Petri dish. And every day, you're going to lose a certain amount. So the goal is to watch the best ones grow. And if you have enough embryos, typically for someone in their 30s, if you have more than four embryos, it gives you the opportunity to watch them grow in the culture dish and then do a day five embryo transfer, meaning five days after the eggs were retrieved. However, conventional IVF is where, because of that continued attrition, if there's less than four, you might not make it to day five and have anything and lose out on the transfer. And it might be better to transfer the embryo on day three maybe transfer more than one to give you the same live birth rate that one on day five would give you. So that's why you do it. You're looking at the quantity, you're recognizing these embryos are in an artificial construct. They are in a lab and you wanna be able to have a transfer. And if you're losing a certain amount each day, the theory goes, do a day three transfer. A lot of centers, no matter what, wanna do a day five transfer, a conventional IVF will base day five, versus day three based on how many fertilized so that you can optimize this patient's chances of success. How many IVF babies have been born since Elizabeth? I actually should know that piece of information, but I don't, but it's in the hundreds of thousands, if not above a million. The last time I checked, I believe, um, in the American population, about 4% of babies are born from in vitro fertilization. I love this next question, and I hope I don't get too much on a soapbox. If the recently released draft Supreme Court opinion regarding Roe v. Wade becomes final, how do you think this might impact IVF, embryo creation, embryo freezing? Great question. So first of all, in my opinion, um, Roe v. Wade is perfectly reflective of the need for individuals to have reproductive freedom, number one. Number two, being pro-choice means you're pro-reproductive freedom. Number three, reproductive freedom means that you want individuals to be healthy. And no matter what happens in our lives, there are needs, whether it be social, emotional, medical, for individuals to need to terminate a pregnancy. That will always happen, and that's never going to end. And if Roe v. Wade is taken away, for me, that is a complete misperception of it, what it means to protect an individual's or a woman's health because it is anti-woman and anti-protective to take it away. Now, how's it gonna affect IVF? It's a concern. Basically, from what I understand, and I'm not a legal scholar, it's gonna take everything back to the states. And therefore, if you're in a state, for instance, like Massachusetts, you're still gonna have access to these therapies because the federal government plays no role. But in those states where they're going to interject themselves and pass these anti-female, anti-feminist, anti-reproductive choice laws, IVF is going to be impacted because they're defining life in a way that makes absolutely no sense. An embryo is not a life. I'm not trying to project my ethics, but 
I've been doing OBGYN for nearly 40 years. And life is conferred by an, to an embryo, a group of cells, after there's an interaction of nutrients, nurturing, and connection between that embryo and the individual mother that is carrying that embryo. And to think that embryos that are frozen will not will need not be allowed to be frozen. And therefore patients will not be allowed to do IVF and patients will have no opportunity to overcome some of the medical barriers and challenges they have is anathema to me. It's, it's, I can't even fathom it. So it is the soapbox that I'm on right now, but I do think in those states that don't protect women, um, yeah, IVF will be impacted, I do. And I think that's the next step in this process if that is taken away. If you are overweight, is IVF a good thing? Okay, great question. So as we all know, um, America, like much of the Western world, is suffering, quote unquote, from somewhat of a weight crisis, obesity crisis. Okay, a lot of reasons that weight plays a role in fertility is because if someone is severely underweight, or somebody might be significantly overweight, it will impact their fertility, mostly through ovulation. We published data back in 2015-ish, where we did the first study looking at the impact of weight on IVF. And we did our best to control as many confounding factors that you can control. And we looked at embryo quality. And that hadn't been done. And the data we published showed that for women who were defined or individuals who were defined as severely overweight, which is a BMI over 40 kilograms per meter squared, they did have a significantly lower chance of achieving a pregnancy that lead to a live, leads to a live birth when the embryos transferred to them compared to normal weight women who had the same type of embryo transfer. So it plays a role, and that role is statistically significant. But a lot of women or individuals who are overweight don't need IVF, and they might do fine. They might do fine with ovulation induction. But a reproductive endocrinologist should be telling individuals what their primary care physician would be telling them. Eat a healthy diet, exercise regularly, stay well hydrated, and do things in moderation. And when that is employed, things tend to work pretty well. But yes, we have data for patients who are severely underweight or significantly overweight that it will impact IVF success. And I'm moving down here. I'm not Mr. Technically Proficient, so I apologize. Here's a good question. What is a good HCG for the first beta after a transfer? Again, let's orient everybody to what um, is being referenced here. HCG is the hormone that confirms the presence of a pregnancy. And after transfer, whether it's 10 days after a day five embryo transfer or 12 days after a day three embryo transfer, a good HCG or pregnancy level is over 100. That's pretty reassuring. When it's above 50, it's less reassuring. And when it's below 50, it's even more um, less reassuring. And it all depends on how it rises. So many individuals who start out at a 50, which is somewhat disconcerting, suddenly have a good rise and do really well. And I've had patients have normal outcomes who start with an HCG of 10. And the presumption is this won't be a viable pregnancy. And most of those are not. But I've had patients where it has led to a viable pregnancy. But to directly answer that question, you like it over 100. That's the most reassuring and you want to see an appropriate rise. This next question is rather complicated, and I'm going to do my best to answer it in an uncomplicated way. So here we go. I've had two failed thaw cycles. So to orient everybody, this is an individual who's gone through IVF and has surplus embryos that are frozen. 
and I did ERA with results showing I'm receptive. ERA is an endometrial receptor assay. It's a test that's done when particularly there's failed transfers to see what is the best timing and receptivity window to transfer that embryo related to the timing of the hormones that are being used. As I received the ERA results, I also received a celiac diagnosis. Number one, I'm sorry you had to go through all that and receive that diagnosis. And I hope you're feeling okay. And for those who um, may not know what celiac is, it's basically a um, condition in which one has somewhat of an allergic response to gluten. Could there be correlations between the failed thaw cycles and this diagnosis? I don't know. We do know that the rate of celiac disease in patients with otherwise unexplained infertility is higher. And there is data to show that with decreased gluten intake and the markers of celiac as they improve, patients have higher success rates either with IVF or just perhaps conceiving on their own. There is data to confirm that, but I don't have a piece of data that says that's why that thaw cycle didn't work. Does a protocol change when diagnosed with an autoimmune disease? Despite what might, one might read on you know, Google or the internet or talking to friends and should there be treatment for the autoimmune disease separate from um, the IVF? Yes, there should be. But does the protocols really change? No, they do not, despite what might, some people might think. Are my chances to be successful with a thaw cycle reduced at all with a celiac diagnosis? Like I said, I don't know. I can say that success rates can only get better with the treatment of the celiac, and that's great. And I love the fact that the endometrial <coughs> receptor assay is receptive, and I don't see any significant changes in your treatment as you go on, meaning the IVF treatment, but success rates should improve as you get better and you treat the celiac as opposed to necessarily changing the protocol for IVF. Um, two women couple here, if you use, and that's how they said it, I didn't say it like that. If we use donor sperm, do we ever have the option of meeting the donor? We'd like to eventually, if it works, thanks and appreciate the event tonight. You're welcome, I love this stuff. Um, yes. You have a choice. The sperm banks that you use, you want to make sure they're regulated federally and that the individuals who've deposited the sperm in that sperm bank, it's been quarantined at least six months so that that donor, um, that donor has been checked for the appropriate medical screening both at the time of deposit and six months later. Okay, so you're using that good kind of a sperm bank in which that individual has been screened. And you have a choice of having what's called a directed sperm donor or non-directed. And directed means, yeah, you could notify that um, individual. I find that most of my patients don't choose that type of donor. And I find that the choices you might have, if you choose that type of donor, are going to be limited. But yeah, you do have that choice. I'm not understanding this next question, and I apologize for that. Um, at the beginning of my journey, my doctor mentioned an IVF where the embryo is put back inside you to incubate, I think I know what you're talking about, instead of in the lab, and then taken out and transferred. Um, I've never seen it done. I know of it. I know there's some technology where basically... And what I understand, the embryo that's created from IVF is put that back in a, like a cervical cup that's inserted into the vagina and over the cervix and allowed to grow there, then taken back and assessed and transferred into the uterus. That's all I know. I can't answer it more than that. I don't know the data on it, um, but I know somewhere out there that technology has been applied, and I, but I can't really address the success rates. Moving right along, is a grade embryo three or four better? I'm assuming you're referencing blastocysts. So 
you guys are going to hear this terminology all the time. And so let me address what we're talking about. Okay. So a day three embryo is called an embryo. And it has six to eight cells typically. And those cells either look fragmented a little bit, a lot, or less so. And at that stage of development, six to eight cells, you want a grade A or grade B, which means the cells aren't that fragmented. Okay, what I think you're referencing is blastocysts. Blastocysts are day five or six embryo. And they're either being transferred in a fresh cycle, meaning the eggs were retrieved five days prior, or they've been frozen subsequent to an IVF cycle. Okay, so what blastocysts, day five or six embryos can be frozen? They're graded and they're graded, the first number is a number and it goes from three to six, and it reflects the size of the embryo. And it ranges from three to six. Here you're referencing three versus four, who's better? Well, there's more scoring that's done. So then there's another score looking at the inner cell mass. Those are the cells that give rise to the fetus. And they are a clump of cells that are graded according, essentially, how many cells there are. It's essentially a quantitative assessment. And then there's just another score that looks at the trophectoderm. I don't want to get too fancy here, but that's the cells that give rise to the placenta. So a typical embryo could be a 3BB, meaning there's enough cells in the inner cell mass, the trophectoderm, and it's large enough in this grade three that it can be frozen. And it goes all the way up from 3BB up to 6AA. That is the grade. And when they're frozen day five or day six, they all have the same survival rate upon thawing, and they all confer the same live birth rate upon transfer. So the way the lab will choose, for instance, in a thaw cycle, which embryo to choose, they're going to decide based on, number one, the patient may have had these embryos undergo genetic testing, and therefore the genetic sex of that embryo might be known, and a patient might choose it, and that's totally fine. But if the patient's not choosing the embryo, and it's a random choice, the lab is going to see how that embryo developed into a blastocyst and typically take a day five embryo over a day six. Not because it's better, but they have to have some criteria to choose and they're going to say, well, this one developed faster and it's bigger, so let's choose that one. But once you go from 3BB up to 6AA, you should be reassured that these blastocysts are essentially equal and their capacity to survive a thaw and to confer a live birth upon transfer into your uterus? Well, that is a great question. Um, too bad we don't still have Elizabeth here for this. I don't know if she'd give all her secrets away, but hi, will an IVF baby need to go through IVF in the future? No, no. Infertility, unless it's due to some known genetic mutation, which is basically, basically something you see in men, not um, in women, for instance, infertility is not passed on. And no, an IVF baby is going to have the same rate of infertility as the general population. And one of the nice things of seeing Elizabeth tonight and meeting her is recognizing she is no different than any person you see, any individual you see. And she is not inherently infertile. So if Elizabeth were trying to conceive or any IVF baby were trying to conceive, if there's no genetic reason that their parents had infertility that is passed on, they have the same rate of infertility as everybody else, which basically in the reproductive age population, 15% of couples are infertile. Great question. When can I go for a frozen transfer um, after having a baby? I'm six months postpartum after my fresh transfer. Well, number one, most importantly, congratulations. That's great. Um, that's why I love what I do. My favorite visits in the office, by the way, um, is seeing patients at their best. And that's when they come back with the baby. So without sounding pejorative, you see patients at their worst. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but you see them when they're stressed they're incredibly anxious and they're worried that they can't build their family. But when you know that the chances are really good that they're gonna be successful, you know you're gonna to get to see them when they're at their best. 
I had a bunch of those visits today. It is literally the best feeling in the world. So number one, congratulations. Number two, I think this question is gonna be answered by your obstetrician. It's my understanding that if you had a vaginal delivery, there were no complications, you have a normal postpartum pap smear, your uterus is back to its normal size, and you're not anemic, then six months is usually a time where you can get, it's not like you're allowed to get pregnant, nobody can stop somebody from getting pregnant, but recommendation is um, to get pregnant six months after that vaginal delivery, and that would include undergoing an embryo transfer. If you had a cesarean section delivery, typically your obstetrician is gonna want you to wait 12 months, but a lot of that's gonna be dictated by the age of the patient, whether that patient has surplus embryos frozen, and if that patient doesn't and they need to conceive because their window of opportunity is narrowing, they might not wait that 12 months, but typically it's 12 months after C-section, six months after vaginal delivery. Okay, I'm going to the other side. Um, great question. These are all, by the way, very good questions. And I can see it's a very well-educated audience who are all are going through this process. What is the projected outcome of adding low-dose HCG to IVF stim cycle instead of Metapure? It's like I had said earlier, you learn more about how a patient responds to treatment when you give that patient treatment. So there's no perfect template that says, what medication at what dose and what protocol is best that for you, that individual. Unfortunately, IVF doesn't work that way. And that's because there's too many confounding factors to figure out what is the best approach. So you kind of use your background and your education and your experience to figure out the best protocol. So what this patient is asking is, there's two hormones that grow the eggs during IVF is the FSH, you guys probably have been used to taking folistin or gonalef, that's the FSH. And then there's the LH, that's the other hormone that helps the FSH grow the eggs. Okay, one way of taking that LH is Menopure, which is somewhat of a combination of FSH and LH, I'm getting way too complicated here. And then there's HCG, which is a pure form of LH. And randomly, some patients you find will respond to one better than another. It's literally unpredictable, but it's not uncommon, myself included. If a patient seems to have somewhat more of an attenuated response to treatment that you might otherwise not have expected, you say, okay, what can I do? What can I do to make this cycle better? I now know more about this patient. I know more about the more precise cycle. I think she might do better with HCG. And that could be vice versa, but I can't project to a success because there's too many factors involved in everybody's individual cycle to say what it might be. But IVF is, okay, you did this, what might work best next? And I hope the HCG works for you. But that's a common way of seeing if you can improve a patient's outcome. A great question, I love this next question. Um, and I don't want you to be nervous at all. Um, how common is it to ovulate before an egg retrieval when doing an antagonist protocol, really nervous about this happening. This is amazing that you guys are this educated with the terminology and what you're doing. I'm I can tell my audience is really into this. Okay, an antagonist protocol, what's an antagonist? So every month a woman ovulates, her pituitary gland produces the FSH that stimulates the group of eggs that are ready in that month. And so what happens is, the FSH, when a woman ovulates, grows an egg. And as the estrogen increases from that growing egg, LH is released, and that makes that woman ovulate. Okay, so if we're doing IVF, and what we're doing is rescuing those eggs from dying off, so you're building a whole bunch. But if you're going to raise estrogen, which is what we do when we take these injections, you're going to cause a release of LH, and the patient's going to ovulate, and then her egg retrieval is gonna be impacted. So to this patient's excellent terminology and point, during the treatment, you start taking an antagonist. An antagonist prevents that LH from being released. Nothing works better. It's immediate. It works extremely well. And rarely, and I'm talking rarely, you see a patient not respond 
to the antagonist. I think a lot of patients get nervous that let's say due to a busy schedule or delays in the operating room that they took their trigger shot, they were projected to have their egg retrieval 36 hours later, and then it ends up being 37 hours later. You're not going to need to worry because the window is up to 40 hours. And if you're taking an antagonist, it is going to prevent that ovulation. I literally can't recall any patient of mine breaking through an antagonist. And I hope you don't get nervous about it because it is exquisitely unlikely and rare. So I don't want you to be nervous about that. <clears throat> oh, I love this question. It's long, hold on. Um, if I think a maternal fetal medicine specialist might want to answer this question because I know what their answer would be, but here we go, everybody. Um, thank you for hosting this event. You're welcome. When you're high risk, parentheses, 41 in diabetic, close parentheses, and the biologic clock is ticking, is it better to transfer one embryo or multiple embryos during IVF? Obviously, it would already be a high risk pregnancy in and of itself. And of course, multiple birth pregnancies are also high risk. But because of the limited time frame, is it better to take the chance with multiples or play it safe with a single embryo transfer? Okay, nobody wants any individual with a comorbidity like diabetes who's of an advanced reproductive age to have a multiple pregnancy. It is exquisitely high risk. And what I mean by exquisitely high risk, high risk of preterm birth and the lifelong consequences of that might confer, uh, high risk of um, high blood pressure, uh, placental insufficiency, a difficult obstetric outcome. So any maternal fetal medicine specialist or obstetrician doesn't want me transferring more than one embryo, but I do understand your point. And sometimes at age 41, your options are limited. You may, and I don't know, you may have a diminished ovarian reserve where you have to transfer more than one in one cycle. So the better part of valor in this situation is to see if you can do get to day five and transfer one embryo at a time because a day five embryo will give you the highest live birth rate. And if you have a good ovarian reserve and you have a bank of day five embryos from an IVF cycle, doing multiple single embryo transfers with a day five embryo will give you a high live birth rate and it will lower the risk of multiples. Another way of saying it, let's say you have two individuals and they have the same bank of day five embryos and one patient transfers one embryo at a time and the other patient transfers more than one at a time. Overall, the cumulative live birth rate between these two patients is the same. It's just that one patient is doing it one at a time in mitigating the risk of multiple. So that would be preferred to get to day five. If the ovarian reserve is diminished and during an IVF cycle, so many follicles give so many eggs and so many fertilized. And if you have less than four fertilized eggs, meaning embryos, you might not make it to day five. And that's where it might be, quote, worth the risk, unquote, to transfer two on day three. The risk of twins in that instance upon conception would be 15%. So that's a risk benefit analysis. You want to get pregnant, your window of opportunity is narrowing, and perhaps that would be the best way in that situation to do it. But the goal is to try to do a day five transfer. And as you can imagine, you guys, this is where insurance plays a role. When patients are insured and they have access to these treatments, they can do the multiple cycles that I'm talking. So they can mitigate the need to transfer more than one. But it's so frustrating when you don't see insurance in place, which is so unfair, where these patients have to take risks to maximize the outcome in that one cycle, and then you have a high-risk pregnancy. I make the argument all the time, if these treatments were for the male, they'd be covered by insurance. And it frustrates me that that plays a role here. But try to aim for a day five transfer and try to mitigate the risk of multiples. Uh, 
Um, this next question is too hard to answer because like I said before, we learn from each patient, but here we go. What can be done to get the better egg retrieval? My first round of IVF, we got 14 eggs and only two embryos. One had Turner syndrome and Turner syndrome for the uninitiated is basically where the embryo itself, instead of having 46 chromosomes, had 45 and was missing one of, quote, what's called the sex chromosomes. So this would be Turner syndrome, potentially viable, potentially could cause a miscarriage. It's a common cause of miscarriage, but it can be viable as well. Um, and the other is high mosaic. High mosaic means that the percent of DNA that was being amplified to assess the genetics of chromosomes of the embryos showed that there was a lot of abnormal DNA. So this patient is frustrated that um, she went through this treatment, she got a high egg yield, but in the end, not a good embryo yield. My BMI is 33 and I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Other than lose weight, which I am, which I am is there anything I can do to get better results? Okay, like I've said before, your reproductive endocrinologist needs to learn from the previous cycle and he or she will learn from the previous cycle to make it better. You're doing all the right stuff, eating a low carbohydrate diet, seeing a nutritionist, exercising regularly, all of that will improve your inherent fertility as well as your response to IVF. It's well known that patients with the polycystic ovarian syndrome and for those who are uninitiated, that's an ovulation disorder that prevents regular ovulation. It actually impacts eight to 15% of all women, not just those who are infertile. So it's not uncommon, but it's known to give high egg yields and poor egg quality. So looking at the things you're doing, you're doing the right thing, number one. Sometimes you wanna take what's called an insulin sensitizing agent. You might be on it already, something that you probably heard of called metformin, which might help egg quality because it lowers the insulin levels in your body, in your body, which in turn will help egg quality. But in my opinion, if you're doing those things, maybe take an insulin sensitizing agent and your reproductive endocrinologist learned from the previous cycle, you're gonna do better and you're gonna have a better outcome. It just, you don't know until you do that first cycle and it gets so frustrating. But the fact that you got 14 eggs and with the tweaks that you make, I would think that you have a very, high chance of overall success. It's just that the journey getting there is hard. It's really hard. Is it safe to do a frozen embryo transfer while breastfeeding? Again, kind of a question for an OBGYN. The old school thought way back in the 80s when I was in residency that if a woman got pregnant, however she got pregnant, or an individual got pregnant while she was breastfeeding, if she's breastfeeding, the nutrients that should be going to the baby she's carrying are being taken away, but that has really not stood the test of time. So the bottom line is it is safe to do an embryo transfer while you're breastfeeding, as long as your obstetrician says you're ready. Again, it's been at least six months since you delivered, you're not anemic, your metabolic profile looks okay, and your uterus is well healed. If you're taking hormones um, for that transfer, meaning estrogen and progesterone, it's okay, it's safe, it's not gonna problem, but will likely accelerate shutting down your milk production. If you're doing a natural embryo thaw cycle where you're timing it with your ovulation, you're really not adding any medications that would have any impact um, on the baby. So yeah, it is safe, but it's something you really want to address with your OBGYN. How many cycles are required? This is a common question and a good one. Um, from the time of an egg retrieval until the transfer of genetically tested embryos. Okay, I would make the argument that none of these treatments are for the inpatient patient. People who are suffering, and I use the word suffer 
infertility is a disease, but people who are suffering from infertility, by the time they've seen me, they want to be pregnant yesterday. And I get it. And the timeline never feels good to them. But if you are doing IVF, where you're genetically testing embryos, you're looking at the chromosomes, what is the time frame? Well, here, you're going to have an assessment with your reproductive endocrinologist. That's a month. You're going to have a follow-up visit at the time when the labs are all back. Okay. At that visit, that reproductive endocrinologist is going to write orders for your IVF cycle. If you're doing this under the guidance of insurance or under the purview of insurance, it's going to take them a month to approve the cycle. So already we've had a month of testing, and now we're waiting for insurance approval if this has been done under insurance. Then you're going to create the embryos. That's the IVF cycle. The embryos are frozen, and then you're in the middle of your next menstrual cycle by the time genetic results come back. And so then the following cycle is when you thaw and transfer the genetically or chromosomally normal embryo. So a month of testing, a month of waiting for insurance approval if it's being done on insurance, creating the embryos, another month, middle of your next menstrual cycle by the time you get the results, and then you do the thaw cycle. So I try my best, and I don't think I do a very good job, of telling all my patients when they come in and they decide to choose that type of IVF to recognize the time frame. It's never as fast as they want. So I hope that answers the question. A lot of patients have frozen embryos and they're doing genetic testing. Um, can a frozen embryo be pre implanted pre-implantation genetically tested. That's called PGTA. Okay, just to um, put us all on the same page and educate the newly initiated to this process, what are we doing when we're testing embryos? Okay, like I said before, when you score embryos, there's a size, there's an inner cell mass, and there's a trophectoderm. The trophectoderm are the cells that give rise to the placenta. And when patients have made the decision for whatever medical reason to check the genetics of the embryo, a portion of the trophectoderm, the second layer of cells, the cells that give rise to the placenta are removed, the embryo is frozen, and those cells are checked for their genetics or their chromosomes. And chromosomes basically reflect how our DNA is packaged and an optimal embryo has 46 chromosomes. Okay, so you typically do that before the embryo is frozen. The patient's asking, can you do that with a frozen embryo? Yes, you can. It's cumbersome. It's often done and patients often choose it. We do have some data at um, Boston IVF done retrospectively, so um, not perfectly precise that it might, when you put an embryo through testing after it's been frozen, it might have lower implantation rates. So the way you do it is you thaw the embryo, Okay, it should survive the thaw because 95% do. You remove those cells, and then you refreeze the embryo while you're waiting for the results. The practical aspects of doing that is none of that would be covered by insurance. So you're paying for thaw, you're paying for the biopsy, you're paying for the refreeze. So yes, it can be done. Many patients choose it, especially those that wish they had done it originally, and they may have suffered from miscarriages. But please recognize that we do have some data that that embryo, when it, then, when it is then thought again, after the genetics come back, might have a lower implantation potential. But yeah, it can be done. How soon do I need to stop the birth control pill if I want to start IVF? Well, I'm not quite sure why you're doing the IVF. I'm not quite sure if there's an infertility issue because if you're on the birth control pill, um, I don't know if it's doing if it's to regulate your periods. I don't know if it's for contraception, but I'm assuming you're doing IVF either to preserve your fertility or to get pregnant because you know you have a need for it. So testing has to be done to see if you're ready for it. Particularly, you have to do an assessment of the ovarian reserve to make sure you're a candidate for IVF, to make sure you're gonna to respond to treatment. But typically you wanna be off the birth control pill and obviously when you stop the pill, you're gonna get what we call a withdrawal bleed. 
but you want to wait a month just to do the testing so it's accurate. So the reason you take a month off is for adequate testing to see if you're a candidate for IVF. But theoretically, you could stop the pill and just start the IVF. It's just that um, you do need that assessment and you want to do that with the following menstrual cycle, not the bleed that you got from coming off the pill. I think I've exhausted most of the questions and I'm sure most of you are starting to go to bed because it's eight o'clock. So I think we can end it here. I hope that was useful. I can, I can honestly say out of all the Facebook Live talks I've done, this was the most educated um, group of patients I've seen, all of whom are already in the active IVF process. Previous Facebook Lives, it's patients who wanted to see if they even needed to do infertility treatments. <laughs> um, I, I kid, <laughs> a, pa oh, a patient asked me a very personal question that's funny, but I don't think it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna address this last question because it's an important point and one that is often misunderstood. So let's close on this question. Um, I ovulate regularly. My hormones are good, in good balance. I'm paraphrasing here, but my AMH is low. Okay, here we go. AMH is the anti-malarian hormone. That's what it stands for. It is a hormone produced by all the growing eggs that you have each month. The AMH does not reflect your fertility. It only reflects in the setting of infertility or fertility preservation, how you might respond to treatment. So there's a common misperception out there that your primary care physician, your OBGYN can send you to a reproductive endocrinologist and he or she can do fertility testing. Sure, we can do testing, but the only way to know if a patient is infertile is that patient is trying to conceive. And if that patient gets pregnant, that patient is not infertile. So in other words, to do a test that basically only reflects how you're gonna to respond to treatment doesn't reflect your fertility status. So the way you phrase the question is great. Your hormones are balanced, your AMH is low. You might be fertile. I don't know. Those tests don't reflect that. If you have subfertility, meaning you're not getting pregnant and you need our treatments, the low AMH will guide us on how we should give the treatments. What's the dose of medication we should do? But if your hormones are otherwise good, you should be reassured. I think the best way to look at it is, you know, don't wait more than six months to, to try to get pregnant. If you're not successful, the low AMH might suggest you need to get to us faster than not, but it shouldn't provoke a level, of, a level of anxiety that it often does because it really doesn't reflect your fertility. It reflects how you'd respond to treatment if you are infertile, I hope. It's kind of a conundrum because you would think, well, if it's low, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you, nothing's wrong with you. And so I would be reassured by your hormone balance as you phrase it, I'd be reassured that you're more likely to be fertile than infertile and not be alarmed by those tests. But in the setting of infertility treatment, let the doctor use those tests to guide your treatment. Okay, so uh, I wanna say goodnight to everybody and I wanna thank you. It's kind of humbling and it's an honor to be able to speak to people who are suffering from infertility and have these questions and feel like they never get to see the doctor as much as they want. They never get to talk to a professional as much as they would like. And that's the nature of the game, but this is hopefully an opportunity to answer some of those questions in a reasonable way. And I hope everybody has a great night.